started. My name is Rick Kress. I'm on the board of the Thanksgiving Roundtable. Good to have all of you here with us. And I want to introduce our sponsor, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, Greater Detroit Chapter. And here to uh, tell you a little bit about it and then introduce our speaker is Diane Goyas. I also am the current president of the chapter. Um, I just wanted to share very quickly that we have three, if you're not familiar with us, we have three major goals. One is to um, help, in, help enforce or ensure that, the, that the, um, we have the highest ethical standards in fundraising in this area. Um, the second is to uh, in, in for, or encourage um, volunteerism and uh, philanthropy in our area, and the third is to provide professional uh, development and growth opportunities for those who are involved in fundraising. And one of the things that's um, different about the AFP than some other similar type of, so of associations is that we serve all types of and sizes of nonprofits. And then also anyone who is involved in fundraising in those nonprofits. So the executive director, um, the board members, program, anyone, anyone at any level who's involved is welcome to be a part of our chapter. And we have monthly programs and networking opportunities. There's a lot, a lot that we do. And we're very, very happy to be a sponsor of this program. We, we try to do that annually, and I encourage you to visit our table um, in the main room when you have a chance for more information. So I am now pleased to introduce Dennis Mitchell, our speaker. Um, Dennis it began his career as an estate and gift attorney, tax attorney for the IRS in Detroit. He was then assistant vice president of America Bank in Detroit, where he headed the Estate Tax Division of the Trust Tax Department. He joined Barry Mormon PC in 1985 and formed the Dennis Mitzel PLC in 2012 and practices in the Ann Arbor, Detroit, and Birmingham area. He's also a past president of this organization, Family of Round Table of Southeast Michigan. He plays in the Golden Masters Hockey League and coached youth hockey for many years and is a frequent lecturer lecturer on estate tax with generation skipping tax and charitable giving topics. So welcome back. Okay, that should be working. Uh, you have several items uh, one of the course materials, they were, they are online. I didn't bring the course materials. Uh, in addition to that, we have a little uh, one-page tax sheet that the Lavasco group offered. And so we're not going to really be using that today, but uh, they were kind enough to give it to us. I thought it might be helpful for you to have the various tax rates. And finally, you have a handout of the PowerPoint slides. And this is what we will be using, so that if you don't have the handout that has the PowerPoint slides on it, then talk to Terry, let Terry know, because he's got a copy for everybody. Everybody should have that. <clears throat> this is going to be a review of the basics, so it is a basic level. Uh, but frankly, with all that's happened in the law lately, uh, basics are mostly what I'm dealing with the clients right now. That's, that's what's going on. It's basics largely with our, our new Income Tax Act. Hopefully there'll be something useful for everyone. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions, I know it's a, a little bit bigger group, um, but if you have questions, please ask them. I think that helps actually to, to uh, address them while we're going as long as we extend our reasonable timetable. I'm not 
probably going to finish all the materials. I'd rather go at a comfortable pace and let some things go unanswered. Uh, we're going to keep this pretty basic. There's no trick questions, so if I put an example up, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not going to give a 20-page uh, story problem. They're all going to be pretty basic situations. So with that, we'll start with estate tax, and we're not going to spend much time on estate tax. The estate tax is currently, the exemption is $11.4 million. As you know, there's very, very few people where the estate tax is still an issue. The estate tax is scheduled to drop back to $5 million or seven in 2026, and there are proposals to bring it to $3.5 million. If you are dealing with donors who are over these numbers, estate tax is very much an issue. Uh, for most of the everyday uh, gift giving, it's not, and we're just not going to spend much time on it today. We will spend some time on the, the biggest current topic, which is the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. This is now a year and a half old news. But for some people, it's just sinking in. A lot of people studied it right away. They wanted to adjust their giving, etc. A lot of people are just figuring out how it impacts them now. The rates are generally reduced. In the written materials, I have given you a comparison of old rates and new. And you can see how everyone is impacted at each particular bracket. But again, we're not going to go over that today. I just wanted you to know that. Married couples, it's almost universal. Almost every bracket is a reduction. For single, most are a reduction, but some are an increase. They kind of got smacked at a couple of different brackets. Some deductions have been eliminated, and there's an increase in standard deduction, which we're going to go over. That's really the thing that has had the biggest impact on charitable giving. So the deductions, pretty much the deductions that we have left, are the medical expense to the extent they're over 10% of adjusted gross income, the state income and property tax, but that's kept at, kept at $10,000, a mortgage interest, but only, at least for new acquisitions, only on acquisitions of up to $750,000, either buying a residence or improving a residence. Uh, and it has to be used to buy or improve. So in the past, we could take out a home equity line, make sure there was a mortgage on our property, and we could deduct interest on that, at least up to 100000 loan. That's out. So if you refinance the house in order to get the kids to college, that's non-deductible. And of course, the charitable deduction. And again, we're going to go into this a great deal. Uh, when the law first passed, depending on what news you heard and who was telling the story, either the average family got creamed by this thing or the average family was really helped. That's because they took the very unusual tact of eliminating exemptions, which were different for everybody, everybody had different number of exemptions, and increasing the standard deduction. And increasing the standard deduction was fantastic if you took the standard deduction, but if you itemized, it didn't do you any good at all, uh, whereas you lost your personal exemptions. And so that made it, frankly, more confusing than it had to be, and that's why we had so many different stories of whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I think overall, uh, the clients that we see, it's probably a modest tax increase but everybody's different. It really wasn't that dramatic of a change. Uh, this is the most important thing, again, from a charitable giving standpoint. Uh, for a single individual, the standard deduction went from 6, 000, around 6,000 to 12,000. For a married couple, the standard deduction went from 12,000 to 24,000. The vast majority of the people are taking the standard deduction. In the past, I think it was about 70% took the standard deduction. Under the new law, it's going to be about 90% taking the standard deduction. So if that 90% is taking the standard deduction, are they getting any benefit out of their charitable gifts? 
No. No. So, so that's the challenge. That's what we're going to see how this really impacts giving. I had a little talk with Robin Farabee yesterday to see if he had knew of any trends yet. Uh, his, his thought was it's, it's too soon to tell because a lot of people didn't modify their plans when the law passed. They're going to start modifying them when they prepared to see this first income tax return and see how it impacted them. Uh, I'm hoping the impact is fairly modest, um, but nonetheless, we're going to have to adjust uh, how we deal with charitable giving. This is uh, the review of those items. When we have a client who's coming in for just about anything, but primarily for estate planning, these are the four, the four uh, items that we ask them about. This is not complicated. With a $24,000 standard deduction for a married couple, it's not complicated. We ask them. Well, most of them don't have the medical. There's a few people who still can take the medical, but generally, they're not going to get that. The state and local tax is capped at $10,000. Uh, mortgage interest, that is kind of a wild card. Some, a lot of people have no mortgage at all, and some people have some pretty big mortgage, but generally we're seeing that's not very big. So if you have a $24,000 target and only $10,000 state and local, you have to have a lot of charitable deduction to be able to, uh, to do something with it. Now, I'll just mention on the state and local tax, when the state and local tax was capped at $10,000, we heard the people in New York and New Jersey, and they all complained because they have high taxes in their states. They said, we're losing all of our deductions. That's not fair to us. Um, I don't prepare those returns, but based on what I've seen, I don't think they lost anything. Because we had a very, uh, very nasty alternative minimum tax, and generally, when I took people who had high state and local deductions, and I tested their return with those deductions and without those deductions, there was no difference. So I don't think those people really lost anything. But it, it's still a factor as we're calculating our, our deductions. So this, uh, this might be a standard. A uh, couple who might talk to me. 6,000 uh, income and property tax, mortgage of five, charitable contributions of three. As I've said, there's no trick questions. There's a $24,000 standard deduction. Are they going to be able to itemize? Of course not. Is there any advice that I can give them that's going to change any of the way they, they do things? No, really not. They're so far away, that's just the breaks. They're going to have to, to uh, deal with that. It's not good or bad, it's just what it is. These are, by the way, these are people under 70 and a half. We have different, different issues for people over 70 and a half, which is really important. Okay, this is another couple. And this couple, this is a surprisingly common example that I've seen. Uh, I'm fortunate, I guess, to deal with some people with modest wealth, whatever that means, who are still very charitable givers. And in this case, they have, they've capped out on the property tax and local tax at 10. They have mortgage interest of six, and they have charitable contributions of eight. That's pretty generous. I think the, you know, if you go across the whole country, people are given $500,000. Um, but a lot of people, particularly, I think, church people, are given some pretty sizable numbers. So they have hit uh, $24,000 exactly. Uh, so let's, uh, in this particular couple, I, uh, I've just shown you 2019 and 2020. They're the same. Each year, if they do their regular pattern, they have $24,000. They're not getting any benefit from their charitable contribution. So the question, and I've, I've kind of let you see the answer there, is there anything we can suggest to them that they might do to get a better result for their charitable giving? And what we can suggest to them is that they double their charitable gift, often called as bunching. Uh, some people are going to take to this and some people are not. It's going to be uh, somewhat personality driven. Uh, I've had, when I talk to people uh, about this concept, uh, some of them had never heard of bunching. Some of them had already told me they were planning, and these are not tax people, they were planning how to put their contributions in one year. 
But if we can get them to take on December 31, 2019, pay their 2020 deductions or their charitable contributions, what we've now done is we've put all of the charitable contributions for two years into one year. And they have $32,000 of deductions. They now have an $8,000 benefit. So they're 8,000 better off than they were. And then when we get to 2020, now they only have $16,000 of deductions, so they take the standard deduction. They get the same benefit of 24,000, even though uh, they have bunched all in one year. So this, this is what we talk to every client about. And then depending upon their circumstances, they either jump on this or they don't worry about it or whatever. Everybody's got a different reaction to it, but I don't want to underemphasize how important this little discussion is. Um, at our church, <clears throat> we made sure we had an article discussing this in the bulletin so that everyone in church could see it. We weren't anticipating they would change their giving, but we wanted them to know uh, if you are giving, how can you take best advantage of those gifts? And I would suggest that all of you have something in your newsletter, etc., that discusses this concept. You're doing a great service. And when you find somebody, it's not a big deal, but when you find somebody who now has an $8,000 deduction, who wasn't getting any deduction, they really like that. So they're very, they're very excited about that. Sure. So, so these people are giving, they're giving all their charity for two years in 2019. Mm -hmm. so that's hard to do. So do you recommend that they go with like a donor advised fund so they can still sort of give charity the next year to the charity so you know, like save them what happened to them, all the money each of those? And then they'll be like, well, we gave you all the after that. They'll be like, oh, that now. Perfect <laughs> question. Um, we had. Can, can I interrupt you for just a sec? I have a microphone if you have questions uh, so the whole room can hear it. Um, just raise your hand and I'll find you. Would you mind repeating that in the summarized version? Um, unless, Dennis, you want to just repeat I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, but, and as well, if anybody came in late and doesn't have the handout, Terry's got more of the PowerPoint handouts <coughs> if anybody came in late. Um, we had in our, <clears throat> in our church and probably in a lot of institutions, I heard of people who called the church and said, I'm gonna let you know you're gonna get some higher checks than usual in December. I just want you to know, don't expect anything next year. So some people started that. Now the people who did that were intelligent enough to do it, but they're not in our world. They didn't even know donor advised funds existed. So you are correct that, the, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, but yes, I, I would recommend donor advised funds be used for that because now they can go ahead and make the gift to the donor advised fund and they get all the deduction in one year and the charities can go ahead and receive it on the same schedule that they always did. So that's, that's what I would suggest. Yes? <laughs> so, I don't know how much money these people are making but maybe it's hard for them to give $16,000 in one year. Like how much of a tax benefit are they really getting to offset that? Well, let's say 25 to 30%. So, so let's say $2,500, $2,000 Now, uh, the same thing, some people, 2000 to 2500 I don't understand this, I, I, forget it. Other people, if I said you could save $500, they'd be all over it. They'd be doing all their calculations, and you know. And I, I have to admit, I'm probably in that category. You know? So, uh, so that's a good question. And we're we're going to talk about this, but since you asked, uh, that's true. If some of this does involve pre-planning. So if someone cannot double up because they don't have the funds, if, we'll use an example. If they give all their money in December. Uh, then what I can do is I can have them, instead of advancing the money, I can have them hold off until January 1. Now it's currently June, so that if I've already been giving monthly, it's kind of too late for that to work. But you can go the other direction. 
and you can double up in next year and take the standard deduction this year. Okay? Let's see here. Okay, the, the reason I put this, I had to remember, the reason I put this example here are that these are people who are kind of shocked that they're taking the standard deduction. Uh, these people had income and property tax of $20,000 in the past. Uh, these people had brokerage fees of $18,000 in the past. Those brokerage fees used to be deductible to the extent they passed 2% of adjusted gross income. So in the past, these people were four times the standard deduction amount when it was $12,000. Uh, they're, they're now shocked to find out they're taking the standard deduction. And in fact, they're, they're giving modestly to charity. So they're probably just going to say, hey, this is the new world. You're going to be taking the standard deduction. Uh, this is a single individual. The single individual, uh, depending on what their, their property taxes are, $12,000 is a lot easier to hit than $24,000. So we have a different dynamic. Uh, they have the $10,000 state, local, and $3,000 charitable contributions. So they will itemize because they're over the $12,000. Now, is it worth it for them? Uh, Two years in a row, they're going to get a $1,000 benefit. If they bunch, uh, they can put the $3,000 each. They can take $16,000 in one year, take the standard deduction the next. They have received, instead of being able to deduct two, they will be able to deduct four. How many of them are going to worry about bunching? It's the same question we had before. Some of them know if they can save $100, they're going to bunch. Others are going to say, it's just not worth it. It's too complicated. I'm, I'm getting a deduction as it is. But I just wanted to illustrate that even if you are itemizing, that doesn't mean bunching wouldn't be a better alternative. Uh, we're going to go to the charitable rollover. Uh, the charitable rollover has been around for a long time. But its significance has suddenly risen to huge proportions with this law change. Um, the charitable rollover means that if I have an IRA, not a 401k, not a SEP, but if I have an IRA and I am over 70 and a half, all of those other examples were under 70 and a half. If I'm over 70 and a half, I may make a direct transfer from my IRA to a charitable organization, and it will be excluded from my income. It's not part of my adjusted gross income. I have to be 70 and a half at the time of the gift, not in the year of the gift, at the time of the gift. So if I turn 70 and a half in December, I'm going to hold off on all my giving till December. It can be up to $100,000 per year to a public charity can't be given to a donor advised fund or to a private foundation. You may roll over your required minimum distribution or any other amount up to the 100,000. So when the rollover is used, the income or the, the, the amount that's transferred is excluded from your income. You don't have to report that whether or not using the standard deduction. So pretty obvious, all those people who were flipping to the standard deduction and were getting no benefit for their charitable gifts are now going to be getting charitable gifts, uh, getting a, a benefit from this charitable rollover. Because it's not in adjusted gross income, it will be excluded from Michigan income. This was always true. But for people who were deduct getting the deduction for their whole charitable contribution in the past, it probably wasn't enough to be an overriding factor. They'd save an extra 4%, but it's a, it's a nice benefit. It's also excluded from adjusted gross income if you're calculating other benefits. Um, now, the general rule, I don't know what percent, 95% of the time, if you can use a charitable rollover 
you're going to use the charitable role. Okay, that's the, almost always the case. So here is our couple who was nowhere near the standard deduction. They have only $14,000 of deductions. They were taking the standard deduction. They've now turned 70 and a half. Uh, will they or should they use the charitable rollover? Of course, yes. No tricks here. It's pretty obvious. They had, had lost the benefit of that $3,000 contribution. When they used the charitable rollover, they gained the advantage. They should always use charitable rollover. You talk to anybody who's seven, over 70 and a half, and they're, they're making gifts to, the, to their charity in any other way, you're going to suggest that they switch that now and use their, their IRA for the rollover gifts. Okay, pretty universal rule. Okay, this, the reason I put this example in here is that this was an individual that I actually talked to. Modest situation, retired, 75 years old, let's say 75 years old. Uh, they have income and property tax deduction of 6,000, but they're very generous for modest income, very generous, $6,000 a year. 75 uh, have been below the standard deduction, even when it was 12. So I happened to be talking to them, and they mentioned that they had the auto deposit, or I'm sorry, the auto pay from their checking account to go to the church on a monthly or quarterly basis, whatever it was. So I told them, cancel your auto pay, flip it to a rollover from your IRA. Now the interesting thing is, we talked about this, this was an individual who had an estate planning attorney and a financial planner. And, and it had been five years and he wasn't taking advantage of this. So uh, he did talk to them and they were a little embarrassed, but there's, usually, there's often a reason. Uh, the reason was they looked over his stuff, including his tax return, but it showed standard deduction. They never saw the charity, and they never thought to ask. So now here's a very modest situation. Five years times six is $30,000. He could have received a $30,000 additional deduction had he made this flip, and he didn't. So again, this, this will help everyone. When you have a, uh, a rollover contribution, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, a rollover contribution from your IRA, Initially, and, and often still, there's uh, forms that you fill out or you contact the institution. There's different ways to do it. A lot of the institutions are now starting to give you a checkbook so that if you want to make a $200 check, which in the past you probably wouldn't have gone through the rollover procedure, but if you got the checkbook, you might as well pay it from your IRA where it's not subject to tax and you will eliminate that from your income. Okay, now we have, this is the couple <clears throat> who was under 70 and a half, and we convinced them to double up. And so instead of getting no benefit at all, they were able to double up 8,000 in, in, in the same year to 8,000, 32,000. They got an 8,000 benefit. They were very happy with that advice. Uh, now, should these people consider the charitable rollover which the answer is always yes. So should these people consider the charitable rollover? Yes, they should do it as well. In their case, if they do the rollover, each year they're going to get the $24,000 standard deduction, plus they're going to exclude the $8,000 from their income in each year. So they have now got a $16,000 benefit instead of an $8,000 benefit. So over 75, always rollover. Okay, we talked about doubling up the gift. <clears throat> this, and we're going to go back to people under 70 and a half for just a moment here. Uh, we talked about, thank you for asking, uh, 
advancing the extra gifts to charity, which is the way we normally think about it happening. Um, but we also can delay gifts to charity after year end that would get the same result if you think about it soon enough. And we also talked about the use of a donor advised fund. Um, I think anyone who's making substantial gifts should be using a donor advised fund if they're not already. There's the advanced gifts that just you know, pay the, the double up on 1231. Uh, we talked about obstacles. I just I talked to someone who uh, they, they're just retiring now. So last year was their last full year of income. Uh, this year they're part time and they, they mentioned that uh, they were now taking standard deduction. I said, well, you could, it was too late to do anything, but I said, you could have doubled up. But it was interesting because I'm always looking at it from the tax angle. He immediately said, yeah, but I don't know if I'm going to have enough in retirement. And I, I'm, I wasn't even thinking of that. I was just thinking of the tax result. But it's true. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, uh, that people aren't having big pensions anymore. And so it's not just, oh, yeah, let's just double or triple up. Um, they do have a concern both for cash flow and a concern for future needs. Uh, in their case, they could have delayed. Of course, last year was his last high income year, so he, he really didn't have probably a great, a great choice. The donor advised fund is a charitable fund. <clears throat> you get the charitable deduction when you pay the money to the donor advised fund. However, you get to have it paid to the charity whenever you want it paid to the charity. I'm presuming everybody is reasonably familiar with donor advised funds. Uh, again, it's a public charity, receives the deduction when, when it receives the gift, and you may hold it for a long time. I gave some examples of donor advised funds. This is just for those who aren't aware, they are everywhere. Donor advised funds are everywhere. Schwab has one, Vanguard, Fidelity, most banks, most brokers, community foundations. Community foundation probably, if we talked about this 10 years ago, you maybe found everybody using the community foundation. Uh, now there's plus it, there's also religious foundations. The, there's a the Catholic foundation affiliated with the Archdiocese of Detroit and one in Lansing. They also have funds. Um, the biggest donor advised funds, the biggest charitable public charities. I hope I have my facts all straight. But the biggest public charities, who do you think on that list would be? It, it's actually not. It's Vanguard and Fidelity. And it's just because they're holding the most money. And if they're holding the most money and they open a donor advised fund, uh, that's where people are using there. So it's not because they have this reputation. Yes? Dennis, is there typically a minimum for a donor to establish a donor advised fund? Um, my experience is uh, that it's going to vary fund to fund. The initial minimum could be, I've seen it 10,000, I've seen it 25,000. I'm thinking that minimum is going to go lower and lower as these become so commonly used. But in all events, once established, I haven't seen any minimums. So, so would it be good advice for gift planners to suggest to donors they set one up? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so the last thing here, uh, my preference, and I don't want to step on any toes here, but I probably will, but my preference is that you find out where the donor does their banking or invest, with their investments. Really. Wherever they use their investments, that's where I like to see the donor advice fund. The reason is, uh, and again, sorry for, for you know, some of these other foundations, but when you transfer appreciated stock, which we're going to talk about, to a donor advised fund, if it's not at your own institution, you, they tell you start by mid-November. Get your paperwork. You're going to have it transferred from the one uh, institution to the other institution. They can do it faster than that, but they warn you to start because they're getting a flood of these requests near your end. When you have a Schwab account and you're online, 
you can go ahead and click on one security on December 31 at 4 in the afternoon, and you can say move this to the other account, and it's done instantly. So now the other thing you can do is before you click that button, you pull up your list of securities and find out where are the biggest gains, and you click the ones that have the biggest gains. So when you use your own institution, it's easy. And when it's easy, I find people make more gifts. So you're probably going to get more gifts if people are using their own institution because it's easy, they get immediate gratification, they, they get excited when they see that old low cost basis disappear, even though the asset has disappeared too. But they were going to do the charitable giving anyhow. So that's my preference. Okay, what to give during life? Again, we're talking people under 70 and a half. So our first rule, rule was for over 70 and a half, always use the, uh, the charitable rollover. The second rule, uh, always, I say always, I, I am an usher, so I do hand the basket out, but <laughs> always give which of these, cash or appreciated securities? Always give appreciated securities. Okay. Um, yes, we, we don't want it. I mean, obviously, I, I, I mean it. I pass the basket out. And, you know, yes, you can pay. You can pay. That's very. It's very normal for small gifts to use cash. There's nothing wrong with that. They still probably make up the bulk of. You can tell me they probably make up the bulk of a lot of gifts. But I always want to use appreciated securities. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. uh, okay, so here is, uh, I, I know we have representatives from Northern Trust, so here's one of their clients here, and uh, this individual, just to make it easy, every single investment that they have is worth $100,000, and they have a basis of different things. Their first stock, they had a basis of 10000 meaning if they sold it, they have a 90000 gain. Uh, the next one they had an 80,000 gain, 70, 60. Then they came down to uh, one stock that had no gain at all, and then one stock that had a loss, and then they had cash. So, uh, let's try this again. <laughs> they want to make a $40,000 gift to charity. Where are they going to get it? From all of these securities or cash, where are they going to get it? This is not a trick question. I put them in the correct order. For you. <laughs> IBM. That's exactly right. They're going to take their IBM and they're going to take part of it. If their gift was forty thousand or whatever, they're going to use forty thousand of the IBM and they're going to make that uh, their gift. Now, uh, what if they say, "I like my IBM." I don't want to get rid of my IBM. I've got 100000 of cash, and the gift is only $40,000. Uh, can I use my cash of forty? dollars Well, can is right the wrong word. They, they, I mean, I, I can be a little more forceful with them. I'm not the charity receiving the fund. Uh, if they say I'm going to use my cash, uh, I am going to tell them, no, you're not. Well, you know, I'll be nice to them, but you're not. If you want to keep your IBM, you're going to take 40000 of the IBM, you're going to give it to charity, you're going to eliminate that low basis asset. Let's make it 100 just for easy. I'm going to give them the whole 100000 of IBM. Now I have eliminated the 90000 problem with the gain, and I'm going to go to my cash, which he wanted to use, and I'm going to buy an IBM. Now he gets what he wants, uh, he's got to keep his IBM, except now instead of IBM have a basis of 10, he's just bought it, he's got a basis of 100,000. Uh, okay, I hate my Ford stock. I'm, I'm sorry, I hope I don't know who's here. Uh, uh, can I give, should I give, is always the word, should I give my Ford stock away to charity? If I hate it. No. no. Right. You're, you're, it's the same deal. If you don't like your Ford stock, sell it. Take your 100000 There's no tax cost. Take the proceeds. Give your IBM stock and buy a new IBM. OK? 
Okay, so if the answer is always the same. I hate my General Motors stock. I've even got a loss. Why don't I give that away? How about that? No. All right, answer is always the same. Uh, in fact, it'd be even worse for the General Motors stock because there's a loss. And if they gave that to charity, they would not get the benefit of that loss. So they would, if they don't like that, sell it. Go ahead, take the loss. Uh, okay, now, uh, I lost a slide here, but let's just say that I have an IRA with $300,000 and a required minimum distribution of 20. So, sorry, it's not up there, but if I have an, an IRA, required minimum distribution of 20, but 300,000 in it, uh, am I going to use, remembering rule one, am I gonna use my IBM stock or my rollover IRA if I'm over 70 and a half? Rollover IRA. Now, it's an easy question for the required minimum distribution, 20. Uh, I will admit there could be other factors depending on what you're doing with your investment people, whether you, you might do a mix. But remember that the stocks at death are going to get a step up in basis. So they might not ever incur that gain. They might, they might not. The IRA is always going to be taxed somewhere. So I would use the rollover IRA. <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to briefly look at this. This isn't comprehensive, but it, I, I, I think it's an interesting concept here. Uh, when I talk to one of my friends, uh, remember pensions are gone. In, in general, pensions are gone. You have people that have a 401k. Uh, they're relying on that 401k to live. And what's their biggest question is they're nearing retirement. Do I have enough? Is it going to last? I don't know this, I don't know that. It's a big question mark. So some of the practical issues that I run into are cash flow, retirement concerns is a huge one. I, I want to make sure I have funds for the children. And this is kind of rare, but, but I'm dealing with one right now. It's, it's a nice problem to have. He's already hit the maximum amount of contributions and wants to give more. So we're dealing with that question right now. Uh, so here's the question. These are lifetime concerns. Uh, of these concerns, in general, when death occurs, how many of these concerns are left? One. One. That's exactly right. One concern left. Funds for children. So if all of those issues disappear except for funds of children, why aren't people giving more large gifts at death because they're concerned about their children. I mean, it's pretty natural, pretty normal, pretty natural. But I just find it interesting that all those other issues disappear and you're left only with the concern for the children. And that, but that's a pretty strong concern and that's something that, that is a practical matter you're dealing with when you're talking to people about death time gifts. But I think it kind of helps to think of it that way. And of course, that's the whole concept of the legal legacy. That when you are gone, yes, you want to take care of your children, but is there something you can do that will make a difference in the charities that you've supported? Uh, I just threw a, a couple here, $2 million. In the past, $2 million, you know, you think, hey, they're set forever. $2 million now, they're, they have the same concerns. They're worried about their retirement. If you said, uh, boy, would you like to make a $200,000 gift? Um, they, you know, they, they probably said, we can't even think of that. Maybe a pledge over a long period of time, we can't even think about it. On the other hand, if, if they had a, a cause they really cared about, could 200,000 at death uh, go ahead and handle that cause? It really could. And yes, you're gonna be balancing against the distribution of children, but it's something to think about. Uh, this is a single individual. This is, this is a situation I really encountered. Uh, Modest, uh, modest wealth, single individual, no children. And of course, that's if, if that was the number one issue at death time giving, no children, well, okay, it makes a difference if you have no children. Um, she asked, she told me that she had wanted to set up a scholarship fund for, for nursing students because she was helped. And they told her, you, you need at least 100,000. Today, that number would probably be substantially more. 
but in any event, she was she was kind of upset about that. She really wanted to do this, and we simply said, why don't you do it at death? And she was thrilled because she easily could do it at death. She didn't have children on her own. She had the funds, and it was a way that she could accomplish what she wanted without having to uh, deal with the concerns that she had for getting through retirement. Okay, death time gifts. Estate tax and income tax. We've already talked a little bit about this, uh, uh, estate tax, and that's all we really need to talk about estate tax right now. Uh, 40%. Income tax. The stocks and most other assets receive a step up in basis. Here's the, somebody who's just got 200,000 of stock. If he sold it during life, he'd have 180,000 of gain. If it's held till death, it has a brand new basis. There will never be any capital gains tax on that. Okay, uh, ordinary income items receive no step up. Uh, these are IRAs, 401ks, 403bs. Uh, those we're pretty familiar with. Uh, IRAs are big, big news. Um, nothing's changed really in them. I mean, some of the, some of the uh, giving rules have changed. But IRAs are taking over where people used to have big concerns about estate taxes. That's been replaced. Their pension's gone. Their 401k is taking up two-thirds of their assets. Dealing with the IRA is going to be uh, the big issue. You're going to need to learn more and more and more about dealing with those IRAs. We're going to run short on time today to go into depth, but we'll go into a little bit. Annuities. When you listen to the radio um, and you can get an investment that will always participate in the market, but will never go down. Uh, they're talking about an annuity, and, and they're it's too complicated to give you the specifics, but they're talking about an annuities. Annuities, a lot of people have them. There's a value to the annuities, and there is a basis to the annuities, and the difference is taxable income. So they're partially taxable. So after the IRAs, which are almost always 100% taxable, after the IRAs, I look to annuities because they're partially taxable. And I also ask, routinely ask if there are E-bonds. Generally, there's not. But I ask because those who do have E-bonds often have a lot of E-bonds. And E-bonds are a hard item to transfer to charity but with proper planning, you can get that done. And they also offer opportunities. Sometimes people have tons of E-bonds. And they, you don't have to report the income each year, but they have a 30-year maturity. When that maturity date hits, they are taxable. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that. The old E-bonds weren't, weren't on the IRS computers. They often slid right by those days and never paid their tax on them, so they kind of got a break. Um, but um, those are now all taxable in year 30. That means you have an asset that the people weren't counting on. They weren't collecting the income. They didn't need it. And all of a sudden, like it or not, they're getting hit with maybe $80,000 of income in one year. It is the perfect gift. They weren't counting on it, they weren't relying on it, and it's thrown all that income in one year. So for e-bonds, you just have to ask. Do they have e-bonds, and if so, get your facts. They can be a real good opportunity. Oh, well, obviously with that discussion, those are the ones that we use. This is a married couple. Uh, we're going to just touch upon some of the issues with IRA beneficiary designations. Uh, each couple here has 200,000. They want to give 50,000 to charity. I'm going to, to the extent possible, use the IRA because that's taxable income to the children. And uh, charity doesn't have to worry about the tax. Pretty easy. I have them each sign a, a beneficiary designation, naming each other as the primary. They're not going to give it to charity at the first step. You're going to give it to each other. 
The secondary beneficiary is the children. Pretty straightforward. Now I get the situation where the husband, in this case, has the IRA and the wife does not. So this adds a little complication. He's going to say my primary beneficiary is my wife, but if she is deceased, $50,000 to charity to balance the children. That works just fine. But if he dies first, who now owns the IRA? The wife owns the IRA. It, when they both had an IRA, we could fill out that designation. We were ready. Um, when she does not have an IRA right now, what will happen is she will have to roll over that IRA after death and hopefully, in the new beneficiary designation, remember to put the $50,000 for charity. So whenever I deal with IRAs, almost all the time, but this is a good example, I want a backup provision in the trust so that if they forget that they wanted 50000 to go to charity, we're going to get 50000 to charity. might not be from the IRA, which would have been ideal, but at least we're going to get the 50000 to charity. Uh, here is a very common situation that I run into. Uh, I have a, a charitable couple, and they have all sorts of IRAs, all sorts of 401ks, rollovers, and for whatever reasons, probably because historically when they worked at particular places, they just left all these accounts open. So now I can go ahead and fill out the beneficiary designation. I have to pick one of these to receive the, uh, the charitable bequest, but from my standpoint as a planner, what do you think my primary concern is when I fill out one beneficiary designation, uh, I'll tell you that if I talk to them in five years, I'm probably going to have a different list. And so they're going to have gone to different financial planners, they're going to fill out new beneficiary designation forms, and perhaps what I've seen the biggest problems, and this has caused severe problems, is someone has changed companies got new beneficiary designation forms, and no one checked with what the estate plan said, and so everything kind of got lost when everything got changed. And they do change financial representation a lot, but in this case, I know what's going to happen, because they just got IRAs and 401ks everywhere, so I know they're going to change. Uh, this, there's a typo here at the top, a single life expectancy is uh, about 16 years. How much time do I have? Five. Five minutes, okay. I want to just talk a little bit about RMDs. Uh, for, for the beginning of this, it doesn't have anything to do with charity. When someone turns 70 and a half, uh, they have, it, it says 10, but it's 16 year life expectancy approximately. <laughs> However, the IRS, just to be nice, says we're going to treat it as if you were married to someone 10 years younger. Now the life expectancy is 27 years, so when you turn 70 and a half and it's time to make that first withdrawal, you can withdraw one divided by 27. That, that's pretty nice. So they're not going to force you to take it out too soon. It's also recalculated every year. So it's not like in 10 years it's gone from 16 to 6. It's actually gone from 16 to 10 because they recalculate it every year. And if, and if you're the part of the group that's still alive, your, your income, your expected age just keeps moving a little bit. So this is what a regular individual does at 70 and a half. Um, after death, if you roll it over to a surviving spouse, they got the same rule. Even though they're now a surviving spouse, they also get a 10-year presumed spouse. Same, same deal. For an inherited IRA, so if they give it to a child, that child must start withdrawing immediately based on their own age. There is proposed legislation to change that to 10 years, but right now, if a 40-year-old son gets an IRA, they get to withdraw it over 40 years, starting immediately, not at 70 and a half. Uh, when you make a payment to an entity that has no life expectancy, this is the five-year rule that we hear about all the time. 
If you make a payment to something that has no life expectancy, if the, like a charity, although charity doesn't care, they're going to cash it all out, but an estate does care. If they're under 70 and a half, paid within five years, and if over 70 and a half, the decedent's life expectancy, which more or less is going to be five years. Why am I telling you this? I wanted to let you know that the charity has no life expectancy. Uh, when I make a payment to a trust, I, if the trust is drafted correctly, it's tricky, I get to look at all the beneficiaries in the trust. They can still withdraw, but they're going to get whosever life expectancy is shortest. Meaning that if that trust gives a $5,000 bequest to charity, I've lost the life expectancy for everybody. That's all I want to let you know. It's, it's, you, can, you can do it, but it's dangerous, and you've got to be very careful. And um, do I have anything else in my remaining two minutes? This is an example of a gift annuity. And I was going to say, do you have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, questions would be fine too. Questions? For the doubling up and the bunching, a lot of people pay out of their cash, right? So that's their paying out of their income, that operation just on the side. Not anymore, though. Pay an extra eight. <laughs> yeah, they're going to pay from their stocks in the future. Right, but, but yes. current situations, yes. um, sounds great in principle, but people paying out of cash for their deduction just don't generally have or don't. Or what is your threshold that you think, or all those that you see of what income or people are affected or moved by that? Yeah, doubling up, the question is if people have cash, doubling up isn't always easy because they don't have the cash. That's the, probably the most common. Cash flow is the biggest issue. Uh, for those people, they can, they can either reverse it and delay the first year payment and hold it, and then they can make the double payment the next year. Or, and this is what I prefer, if they have, not everybody has stocks, some have mutual funds. Um, but if they have stocks and are confident they have enough value that they can make a gift, use the stocks. And then when they when they recover the cash later, they can rebuy if they want stocks. But I, I like to impress upon that that stocks should always be used. But yes, the, the cash flow is a constant problem. No question about it. We have time for one more question. Anyone have one? Okay. If you're new at this game and you're in a small organization, uh, you're trying to establish a relationship to get get money, but you're going to rely on professionals, you know, estate planners or banks or whatever to, to execute this, right? I mean, That's how much of this do we have to execute? No. The, the more familiar you are, the better job you'll do. And you never have to pretend you know something that you don't know. Um, sometimes the more you know, the more free you feel to say, I don't know that. And, and no client ever cares. I mean, if you say, I don't know everything, I guess they'd eventually care, but, but they don't care if, if you can help guide them. And the other thing is you have, uh, uh, you have the plan giving round table. Every single member, certainly all the board members, but I think every other member is willing to take your call. So if you want to call any of the people on the board, any of the members of the plan giving round table, any of the speakers, they're all pretty nice people, and you can feel free, really, to, to give them a call. But yes, the more familiar you are, the better job you'll do, and yes, you'll rely on their own plan. All right, how about a round of applause for them? Thank you. Okay. So we have a gift for you that you can share or hold all to yourself. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And everybody, lunch is in the main room. Please don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Thanks for being here.